I observe, plus a penalty parameter lambda, tuning parameter, times the trace norm of B. It's also called the nuclear norm of B. Remember we saw that the, the uh, trace norm of B, or the nuclear norm of B, is just the sum of its singular values. <clears throat> so we take its SVD, add up its singular values. <clears throat> That's the trace norm. So um, let's back up a bit just to give a bit of motivation for this problem. This kind of thing is often done in recommender systems. So let's suppose um, I think of my matrix Y as having on the rows uh, the classic case, let's say, movies, and on the columns, let's say, people. And for every combination of a person and a movie, I certainly don't have, let's say, if these people are users on the Netflix site, I don't have their rating for every movie. Right? Not everybody's seen every movie. That would be pretty remarkable if, ever, if some person's seen every movie on Netflix. But I have a very sparse subset of entries. Right? Each person maybe has rated on the order of hundreds of movies at most. Okay? And my goal is to fill in the missing, missing entries. So if I think about, again, each person, I want to fill in the other entries of the recommendations this person would have made on the, on the movies he hasn't seen, he or she hasn't seen, so that I can actually recommend the top one to, her, to him or her. Right? If I fill in the entries, and I don't remember if I said that people are on the columns or rows. Let's suppose people are on the columns. I look at your column, and I see, oh, you've, you've rated these movies. I filled in the other ratings, the same estimate. It looks like the highest estimated rating is going to be for this movie, so let me recommend that you see that next. So this kind of stuff is, this actu is actually done uh, in, on Netflix, Amazon, a lot of big uh, sites where people uh, rank things or provide recommendations. Um, the problems they end up solving are more sophisticated in some sense than this simple matrix completion problem, but this is the birth of it all. This is where it all stems. It stems from the, a problem of this form. Um, why are we using the trace norm here? How is that providing us with appropriate amount of regularization? Well, the trace norm you can think of as a convex approximation to the rank of a matrix. So the trace norm is convex because it's a norm. We know that all norms are convex. Um, the rank of a matrix is what? It's the number of non-zero singular values. Okay, so instead of summing them up, I would just tell you how many were non-zero. So the trace norm is to the rank as the L1 norm is to the L0 norm. It's really the matrix analogy of the L1 norm. The L0 norm counts the number of non-zero entries in a vector. The L1 norm adds up their absolute components. Very strict analogy here, very strong analogy, I should say. The, the rank counts the number of, of singular values in a matrix, non-zero singular values, and the, the trace norm adds them up. Okay, so for diagonal matrices, they're actually exactly the same thing. So they reduce to the same thing when the matrix in question is diagonal. So we want a low rank approximation to a partially observed matrix. It's a way of kind of regularizing our estimate. Okay, low rank approximations are also appropriate in a lot of these, uh, these problems that involve recommendation because then they suggest some kind of low rank factor structure that determines people's rankings. So I won't go into that, but if you're interested in matrix completion, you can read up about it. I, I, I gave a, a few references to papers at the end of the, the, end of the lecture, or just come talk to me in my office hours. So let's try to solve this problem, solve this matrix completion problem. Um, it is a convex problem, right? Because, uh, like I said, the uh, trace norm is a convex uh, function. So we're going to think about this again as something that fits into proximal gradient descent. Okay, smooth function plus non-smooth function, both being convex, and we're just going to rewrite it in a form that makes it more convenient to express. We're going to define the projection operator onto the observed set. It's a very simple operator. You pass it a matrix B. It gives you back another matrix B. But it only preserves the entries that happen to coincide with the observed set, omega. And it sets all other entries to 0. Okay, So just zeroes out the entries that were unobserved in the original matrix Y. But you can pass it any matrix, and it'll do that. So with that notation, I can think about my criterion as the sum of two terms. The second term is just lambda times the trace norm of my optimization variable b. The first term I've rewritten this sum of squared, n, uh, squared differences over the observed set in this notation. It's just the Frobenius norm squared of p omega y 
minus p omega b. So the Frobenius norm member is the sum of squared entries of the matrix. And all I've done here is that I've zeroed out all the entries that don't lie in omega. So the only entries I'm going to see in this difference, once I take the Frobenius norm squared, are exactly the observed set. Okay, so this exactly coincides just the sum of yij minus beta ij over the observed set squared. Okay, so there's two ingredients need, needed to apply proximal gradient descent, just like every other case of, proximal, of applying proximal gradient descent. We need to calculate the gradient of the smooth part, and we need to calculate the proximal operator. Once we do that, we're all set. We just follow the steps. So the gradient calculation is um, somewhat simple. I just wrote it in this notation because it's most convenient to do so. But you could have also just thought about differentiating this criterion with respect to beta ij for all i and j. You get the same thing. Uh, so let, let me just tell you what it is, and then I'll explain how I got it. It's the gradient of G is a matrix, just like the gradient of a, of a function that, whose domain is a vector space is a vector. And that matrix is the following. It's just um, what we get from taking PY minus P beta, actually the negative of that. So it's going to be 0 in every entry that was unobserved. And the entries that were observed, it's just going to be beta ij minus yij. Okay, that's the gradient of the criterion. Now, how can I think about taking the gradient of a, uh, an expression that involves a matrix variable? Um, it's really no different from how you compute gradients for expressions that have vector variables. You just think about um, the gradient with respect to each component. Right, so the gradient, I'm just taking the derivative with respect to Bij, that's the gradient in the ith jth spot. Just like the same for a vector. Yeah, I'm taking the, the, the derivative with respect to xi, and that's the gradient in the ith location. Okay, so do that here. Just check that expression makes sense to you. Um, there are no beta ij's in this expression that are on the unobserved set, right? Omega complement. So if I take the, the derivative with respect to such bij's, I get 0. So the gradient's going to be 0 on those components. For the observed set, I just get bij minus yij. That's exactly what this expression is capturing. Okay. Another way of thinking about it is unravel that matrix B into one big vector. So in whatever way you want to do it, like rows first, for example. And then take the gradient as if it were a vector variable, and then reshape it into a matrix for convenience. That's the other way of getting this expression. But I think it's easier just to remember that you know, it's just the same concept, but applied with a different indexing structure. That's it. OK, so that's our gradient. It's, it's the matrix whose entries are bij minus yij when ij was observed and 0 otherwise. And now we need to know the prox function. Um, we're trying to figure out the prox operator of the trace norm, essentially. Remember, and we can just define that as the matrix C that minimizes the following expression. Fermenius norm of b minus c squared times 1 over 2t plus lambda times the trace norm of z. That's the proximal operator of, the, of this function, lambda times the trace norm. OK, that is much more um, involved than computing the gradient, but it's still possible. We can still do that in closed form. So my claim is that the proximal operator here it's just the matrix soft thresholding operator applied at the level lambda t. So uh, there's, again, a nice analogy to the L1 norm case. I'll just tell you what the matrix soft thresholding operator is, and then we'll go through the steps required to prove that. So if you give me a matrix B, I'm going to define this operator S sub lambda of B. It's the same notation we use for actually vector soft thresholding, but it's applied to a matrix instead of a vector. And it's defined as follows. Take the singular value composition of B. So write B is U times sigma times V transpose. Remember, sigma is the diagonal matrix that contains its singular values. Um, threshold, soft threshold the singular values. So march through the, the diagonal and subtract off lambda. And if that's positive, keep it. If it's below 0, set it equal to 0. That's exactly soft thresholding applied to the singular values. Okay, So redefine a uh, soft thresholded version of the singular values, and plug that back in. 
take u times sigma sub lambda v transpose, that's going to be the matrix that I'm going to be taking, soft thresholded version of the matrix. Okay, any questions about that definition before we go about walking through the proof? So right away you can see why um, this is an expensive operator to apply. What does it require? It requires the SVD. I need to know the SVD, or at least a partial SVD, of my matrix in order to apply the matrix soft thresholding operator. But that is the proximal operator of the trace norm. So as far as proximal gradient descent is concerned, there are no two ways about it. That's what we need in order to apply the proximal gradient updates. OK. Um, how did we get this? How do, we, how do we establish that this is the proximal operator of the trace norm? Well, we can do it in a sequence of steps that's very similar to how we derived the proximal operator for the L1 norm, which we did um, a couple lectures ago, our last lecture. Well, we didn't use the terminology proximal operator, but we just took the subgrading of the criterion and set it equal to zero. Same thing we're doing here. Okay, so the problem, the inner problem now is to minimize overall matrices Z. The uh, following expression, right? And we want to know what's the minimizer there, which of course we know, like we said, is unique because it's strictly convex. Proximal operators are always well defined. And to do so, we're just going to take a subgradient and set it equal to 0. OK, so let's just, let's just do that. The subgradients of, the, of this criterion look like, well, just the gradient of the first part because it's smooth. So that's just b minus c plus lambda times t times uh, anything that's a subgradient of the trace norm. I'm going to call that gamma. That's the matrix gamma, where gamma is a subgradient of the trace norm at the point z. OK? Um, so no, nothing, nothing uh, should be startling yet so far. We just want to set this equal to 0 and figure out for what z's is this going to be true. This, the, we have 0 as a subgradient. I'm going to tell you a fact now about the trace norm. Um, I'm not going to prove it. We had it on the homework initially, and then we took it off. We may, uh, it may come back in some form. It's just good practice with deriving um, subgradients. So it's not, not too difficult to prove. The fact is as follows. Um, well, in fact, I'll just write on this, write the answer here, but really it's on the slides. That if I take um, d, which is, let's call it u sigma b transpose, so this is my singular value decomposition, then um, I can always take uv plus w as a subgradient. of the trace norm of z. So all matrices of this form are valid subgradients of the trace norm of z, where uh, w satisfies the following properties. It has operator norm less than or equal to 1. So remember, that means that its maximum singular value is at most 1. And it's orthogonal to the columns of u and to the rows of v. So though any such matrix w which satisfies these conditions, I take uv transpose and I add um, w to it, that's a, uh, these give me valid subgradients of the trace norm. Okay. Now we're going to plug this in, and we're going to prove that we can actually get 0 as a subgradient. So just taking this as a given fact about the trace norm. OK. Um, let's just go ahead and do that. So we want to prove that uh, 
we can write b minus c plus lambda t times gamma equal to 0 for z equal to the soft matrix soft thresholded version of b because that's our proposed solution. So we want to show that this is true. And OK, let's remember what the definition of this is. We're going to take b equals u sigma b transpose. Right, so b minus c, we can write as u times sigma minus sigma, we call it sub lambda, b transpose. Right, because they both have the same singular value composition in terms of their uh, left and right singular factors, and they only differ in their singular values. So this expression is b minus c, as we've defined z, plus lambda t times u v transpose plus w. Um, for some w that, that satisfies these. We want to make this expression equal to 0 for some w that satisfies these conditions. If that's true, then we have established that the solution is exactly matrix soft thresholding at the level lambda. OK. Um, so in fact, let's, let's continue continue here. I'm going to write this lambda t. I'm going to write that expression like this. Uh, we have a, a lambda t multiplying w. OK, so all I've done is I've written this as u times lambda t times identity times v transpose. And I've, again, worked it into this expression where I've pulled out the u and the v on the, on the outside. And what's left over is um, w times lambda t. So uh, the, the claim now is that there is some w that has these property, properties. Its operator norm is less than or equal to 1. It's orthogonal to the, the rows, so the columns of u and the rows of v. And it makes uh, this expression true. OK, so rewritten we have w equals uh, u times sigma minus sigma. This is supposed to be lambda t, actually. right? Soft stress holding at the, at the amount lambda t minus uh, lambda times t times the identity divided by lambda t times v transpose. So that will be the w that makes this true. And in fact, well, this is just negative w. So what's left to show now? What's left to show is that, indeed, this matrix, which we know we must take essentially as w, satisfies these three properties. OK, so let's start off with just the, um, the operator norm property. What's the operator norm of this? What's the maximum singular value of this matrix we've written on the right-hand side? I'm sorry? Oh, this should be a plus. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, if I gave you the SVD of a matrix and I asked for the maximum singular value, you just look at the diagonal, right, of, this, of, the, of, the, sing, of the matrix in the middle, right? I, I gave the SVD, so the maximum singular value is just going to be the maximum entry of the diagonal here. And what's that going to be? What do the diagonal elements look like? Um, they look like, well, for sigma i i that's bigger than lambda t, right, they look as follows. They look like uh, sigma i i minus sigma i i minus lambda t, right? Um, plus uh, 
plus lambda t divided by lambda t. Okay, those are what those this is what this particular entry would look like for the entries that have sigma, why did I write it like this? For sigma i i bigger than lambda t. So what we get here is why does it look like two rather than than one? Yes, thank you. Right. So this was a typo. The gradient is actually z minus b. So the signs are switched here. That was important. Good catch. So that was, that was a typo that propagated all the way through. Uh, initially, of course, the gradient is z minus b, right? The variable is z, not b. OK, so this is actually just going to be 0, which is what we wanted. So it's going to have 0 on the diagonal entries that were bigger than lambda t initially. For sigma i i uh, less than or equal to lambda t, what does it look like? Right, it's going to look like um, minus sigma i i and then remember, we're going to be adding whatever the corresponding diagonal entry was for the soft thresholded version, but that's going to be 0 because we're not, we don't soft threshold things that are smaller than lambda t. We just set them equal to 0 plus lambda t divided by lambda t. And that's going to be less than or equal to 1. Right? Just by virtue of the fact that in this condition, sigma i i is less than or equal to lambda t. So we've checked that. This w in question indeed has biggest singular value at most 1. Okay, I'm going to leave the other two conditions for you guys to, to think about because we're almost out of time and I wanted to get to um, the generality, how, how general proximal gradient descent is. But just to say you know, 10 seconds about it, it's orthogonal really by construction. Um, this thing we just saw is 0 on the, uh, the diagonal entries here are 0 on the parts for which sigma i was bigger than lambda t. That kind of already by construction makes this orthogonal. You can, you can see that. OK, so let's suppose we also check that these two conditions were true. Just check mark it and say, you know, at home, you can do that. And after establishing these two things, we've just satisfied the subgradient conditions with this particular choice, right? Z equals matrix soft threshold of version of B, and that gives us the prox operator. Okay. Um, so more involved than deriving the prox operator for the L1 norm, but still follows right from the definition of the prox operator and what we know about subgradients. And what is the result? The re result is actually the following algorithm, which we call the soft impute algorithm for matrix completion. Following the rules for gradient descent, we have uh, B plus, the next matrix in our update is just the matrix soft threshold version of B plus T times the negative gradient, P omega Y minus P omega B. Um, that's what we might think of as the proximal gradient updates for matrix completion for an arbitrary step size t. Now, if you think about the problem, this gradient is actually Lipschitz continuous with constant 1. right? Um, in fact, the gradient is a linear function. So of course, it's, it's Lipschitz, and it's, its constant is, is just 1. It's directly from the definition of what it means to be Lipschitz continuous. What, what is the norm here for the Lipschitz? For Benius norm. It's just the norm because I because we use the two norm for Lipschitz for vectors. So that's the analogy of what the two, two norm should be for matrices. Uh, why not use another uh, norm such as uh, maximum single value on this norm? Why don't use this norm? Maxim so the norm chosen affects the analysis. So I chose the two norm. I chose to define Lipschitz in terms of the two norm because that's what gave us these rates. 
such results. So for all the results we defined so far, being Lipschitz with respect to the two norm gave us these results explicitly. If you had a different definition of what it means to be Lipschitz, we'd get slightly different bounds. Okay, so it'd still be okay, but you know, it's easy to think about Lipschitz in terms of the Euclidean norm because it gives us these transparent bounds. So uh, sticking with that kind of um, standard definition of Lipschitz continuity, the constant for the gradient is L equals 1 for its Lipschitz continuous parameter. And that means we can choose a step size as big as 1 over 1, which is 1. And we know the algorithm still converges from what we know about proximal gradient descent, right? So let's just do that. This is a case where actually we know the Lipschitz constant of the gradient explicitly. It's one of the rare cases where we know that in practice. And if you stick in t equals 1, you're going to see that actually these updates reduce to the, the following simple updates. p omega y plus p omega perp b. Okay, because this becomes b minus p omega b. So p omega perp means projection onto the unobserved set. It's just b minus p omega b. I'm just denoting that by p omega perp b. So in words, at every iteration, we take our current estimate on the unobserved set. We take whatever it told us is going to happen on all the entries that we haven't seen and why. We put that together with the matrix Y on the observed set. And that forms our, our you know, temporary update. And then we take the matrix soft thresholded version of that. Okay, So we, we make that thing have lower rank, essentially, by performing matrix soft thresholding. So over and over again, we impute the missing entries with what we have in B. And then we do matrix soft thresholding, which basically kills off a bunch of uh, singular values. And we take that resulting matrix to be B plus. That's called soft impute. It's a very simple method for matrix completion. Right? It's a very simple algorithm. And it's, it's fairly effective. I mean, there are a lot of algorithms out there for matrix completion. Soft impute is, is you know, fairly competitive. Um, I think that's probably a good place to end. I still have a bit more to go. And of course, acceleration to cover, but we'll do that on Tuesday.